I want to welcome any that may be visiting. We're glad you're here. Um, Elder D referenced in his prayer that this has been an interesting week in um, Michigan. Yeah, Karen and I were back there. I'm part of the General Conference Executive Committee, and uh, there are some very important issues that were being addressed, and so we need to be praying for the church. I'm not going to really talk about that in the message. If you have questions, I'll be in the lobby afterward if, if you want to ask me personally. Uh, what some of my observations were, I'll be happy to share that with you. I want to talk about the gospel today. You know, one of the um, great passages of Scripture is there in Matthew chapter 5 where he talks about you are the salt of the earth, you are the light of the world. And these are two metaphors, these are two elements and allegories that Jesus uses to explain that people can be saved through you. You notice the Lord doesn't say, I want you to be salt. He says, you are. If you've accepted Christ, then you are that salt. A lot of people don't know, what does he mean by that? Now, especially today in our culture where everybody's being careful to watch how much salt they eat, we think salt has a negative connotation. But you need to transport yourself back long ago when people used to work and perspire and they didn't have enough salt. And salt was not ubiquitous. It didn't come down the road in big semis. And it was such a precious thing and without it you couldn't live. Message is saved by salt. Saved by salt. I don't know if you heard about um, the Great Salt March where Mahatma Gandhi, he began a very effective non-violent protest back in 1930 because you see the British they really occupied India, it was a colony and they were pretty rough on them. They even told the Indian people you are not allowed to even manufacture and sell any of your own salt only the British can sell salt and by the way we're going to tax it heavily. Well that was a very hot and humid country and people would perspire and you could lose enough salt where you could die. And um, so Gandhi got the bright idea, said, I'm going to protest the salt tax. And he began to march hundreds of miles across India towards the ocean. Started out with about a dozen people and it just continued to build until by the time he got to the ocean he had like 10,000 people walking with him. And all he did is he went down there to the shores of the ocean and he reached over and he picked up some of the salt from the salt mines, the dry pools that they had there. And that little act of saying, we are going to make our own salt. We don't need to do this through the British. It was a passive protest. Everyone else then began to follow suit. And that was really the launching of a movement that saved the country from oppression, gave them their freedom and their independence. The great salt march. Salt is amazing stuff. Of course, Jesus says in Matthew 5.13, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its savor, its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It's then good for nothing to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. Got a few amazing facts about salt. You know, salt is mentioned 45 times in the Bible. Actually, you'll notice if you search this on a computer program, you'll find it 46 times in the King James Version, 44 times in the New King James Version. Sometimes the word flavor is... Uh, interchangeable, but uh, there are about 14,000 different uses of salt in, um, in the world today. Salt or saltiness is one of those five basic human tastes along with sweet, sour, bitter, and savory. Salt is a crystalline mineral composed prim primarily of sodium chloride. It is absolutely essential for human life, but in too much quantity, it can be harmful. You need the right balance. It's kind of interesting, if you're lost at sea, you're stranded out in a lifeboat, you can't live without salt, you can't live without water, but if you drink salt water, you'll die. Because the concentration is too high, and eventually there's kidney failure. Conventional wisdom is now that if you get where you're so thirsty out in the ocean, if you drink a little bit of salt water, it will actually prolong your life, but you will eventually die from too much. So. Uh, just in case you ever get stranded in the ocean. I thought you want to know that. <laughs> it's one of the most ubiquitous food seasonings. 
and a very important part of food preservation. We'll get to that in a little bit. Throughout history, salt has always been a precious commodity, sometimes traded ounce for ounce as much as gold. In fact, salt was used to pay people. The Chinese actually had salt coins that they used, and they used to pay people with salt cakes in England. The Roman soldiers were paid with what they called a salary, <laughs> the salarium, which is where you and I get the word salary. It's because they would pay them money to buy salt or they would pay them directly in salt that they could exchange for money and keep what they needed for themselves. And armies sometimes march on salt. One reason Napoleon had to retreat from Russia, not just the cold weather, his army and the horses ran out of salt. In the Revolutionary War, England cut off salt, most of it we got from England. So Benjamin Franklin went to Bermuda and negotiated a special secret treaty to get our salt from Bermuda. During the Civil War, one of the reasons that the South fell is they could not get salt. The, in, the uh, North had most of the salt. The salt used to come up the Mississippi. The North blockaded the Mississippi and when they couldn't get salt to their soldiers and their horses, they began to suffer from that. Wars have been fought and won over salt. So salt why we in our culture are always worried because we are, <laughs> we're just saturated in salt. Everything's got salt nowadays. Did not used to be that way. It was an essential element for health. Your cells cannot process properly without the right amount of salt. And so when Jesus says, be the salt of the earth, some of you are thinking, well, the doctor told me to stay away from that. No, you need it. You got to just transport yourself back to that culture they lived in where if they didn't have salt, they didn't have life. They didn't have health. Now, one of the reasons salt is so important is because of its preserving influence. Um, today, we've got refrigeration. Uh, today, we've got chemical preservatives. Uh, we've got, you know, freezers for our food, and there's other ways that you, you can freeze dry things. We've got lots of ways. We can food. Do you know there was no canning of food until Napoleon? And the first canned food was peas that they put in a wine bottle. They boiled them and put them in a wine bottle and they kept very long. Napoleon offered a, war, an, a reward for somebody who could figure out a way to preserve food because his army, their food would go bad. Army marches on their stomach. Well, now we have that. They didn't have that back then. About the only thing they had to preserve food is you could dry it and salt it. And salt, because it, you know, these to salt fish, I think I got salted fish on the screen there. It doesn't look very appetizing, but that's what, you know, when Jesus multiplied the bread and they had two salty sardines. What they do is they dip it in salt, they dry it in the sun, and it would preserve it for a long period of time. And um, so when the Lord says, you are the salt of the earth, He says, you have a preserving influence in the world. Now a story in the Bible that helps to illustrate this. Some of you remember the Lord appeared to Abraham. He renewed the covenant and he said he was on his way to visit judgment on Sodom and Gomorrah because of their sins. Well the problem was Abraham's nephew Lot and his family were living in Sodom. And so Abraham begins to intercede and he said, Lord, and this by the way is Genesis chapter 18, 26. He said, if, if you're going to destroy the righteous with the wicked, there's got to be some righteous people in the city and they're all going to be doomed because of the wicked ones. And if you can find 50 righteous in the city, would you spare it? Or I said, yeah, I'd spare it for 50 because the influence of those 50 people would have a sanctifying effect on everybody else and who knows, they might be redeemed. Then Abraham begins to think, you know, last time I saw Sodom, I'm not sure there's 50. He said, Lord, what about 45? The Lord said, if I find 45, I'll spare it for 45 righteous people in the city. And he thought a little more. He said, boy, they really are pretty bad there. I mean, it might not be. He starts trying to count on his hands if he can think of 45. How about 40, Lord? He's interceding. What about 30? God said, I'll spare it for 30. If there's 20, God said, I'll spare it for 20. Finally, you get to verse 32, Genesis 18. Suppose there should be 10 found there. And the Lord said, I will not destroy it for the sake of ten. The reason San Francisco is still there, there must be at least ten people <laughs> in that city. This is my theory, anyway. 
You know, I, I saw a study presented by, um, I think it was Time Magazine, they talked about the, the spiritual, uh, the, the number of Christians in the cities of North America, they took the 100 cities, 100 major cities, number one city with the highest m amount of Christian influence was Knoxville, Tennessee, and then it just goes on, most of them in the Bible Belt, and you know, I think like 98 on the scale of the worst was like San Francisco, and then Rhode Island, believe it or not. And um, you want to know where Sacramento was? We're only 72. That's not real good. That's because we got the capital there. You know, the concentration of government. That's my guess. That's my theory. You know what? What happened to Sodom and Gomorrah? Destroyed. What does that tell you? God couldn't find ten. There was just Lot. And his daughters were, their conviction was dubious too. And his wife, she looked back and, and if God had just had the influence of enough people, there's a sanctifying influence of Christians in society. And it happens every day. You probably don't think about it. Just little things, you know. You're, you're driving down the road and you come to the stop sign at the same time and you kind of look at each other and you're wondering who's going to go first. You're the Christian, you go, you go first. I don't honk your horn when somebody's trying to merge and speed up. You're a Christian driver. Amen? Amen. I um, play racquetball with Pastor Ross, and I've seen Pastor Sean at the gym there too a few times. Sometimes we play racquetball with guys, and they're not all churchgoers, I can tell you. Nice guys, but, uh, you know, sometimes if they're not playing well, they let you know. <laughs> and um, they start speaking in tongues. And sometimes I've, I've said, now, oh, go easy, brother. I said, I'm a pastor. You try and be gentle. I said, oh, I'm sorry, pardon my French. I know it wasn't French, though, that they were talking. <laughs> but, you know, and then they catch themselves later. They'll get ready to, and they go, oh, you know, that's a sanctifying influence. There's a thousand ways that you and I, in our words of encouragement, in the culture, we share our faith. Jesus said, not I want you to be, he said, you are the salt of the earth. Are you having a positive preserving influence? All of Sodom and Gomorrah would have been preserved. And it's in the families. You might be the only believer in your family. 1 Corinthians 7, 14. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified, he's preserved, by the wife that believes. And the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Otherwise your children would be unclean. But now they're holy. Your influence as a believer in a family, even if you are in a mixed family, we're talking about with your faith, you have a preserving influence, not only on society, but on your loved ones. And you'd be surprised someday when the going gets tough, they're going to turn to you and ask you to pray. I've seen it many, many times. Peter says, 1 Peter 3, Likewise, wives, be in submission to your own husbands, that even if some don't obey the word, they're unbelievers, they, without the word, might be won by the conduct, the saltiness, if you'll let me say that, of their wives. <laughs> I guess that could come out wrong. When they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear. Here's your answer. God wants us to have a sanctifying influence. It's a preserving influence. It's a converting influence on others. So salt preserves. Salt brings out flavor. You can read in the Bible where even Job asks that rhetorical question, can flavorless food be eaten without salt or is there any taste in the white of an egg? Have you ever eaten tofu with nothing on it? Yeah. Some of you like it. Just, yeah. just, oh. <laughs> it's like yogurt with nothing in it. <laughs> I can't eat potatoes with nothing. It's like glue. You ever eat mashed potatoes with no butter, no salt, nothing in it? It's, yeah, you could, you know, probably glue the fabric on an airplane wing or something <laughs> with potatoes. It's just starch is all it is. So the Bible is saying it, it adds flavor to something. I remember once I was uh, up in the hills and I got some macaroni and I cooked up the macaroni and while I was boiling it I realized, well, what am I going to put in it? I hadn't got, I had nothing. No salt, no butter, no nothing. And um, Boy, I tell you, you ever eat just plain macaroni? <laughs> it's a great disappointment. 
But then if you've got a little garlic salt, I think I found some garlic salt. Boy, what a difference it makes. Just a little salt. Well, you can make that big difference in the culture. The Bible says that that flavor, that savor of salt can be lost. Jesus said, don't lose it. Now you and I might think, well, what does that mean? How do you re-salt salt? How does salt lose its savor? Well, it doesn't really today, but in Bible times they would get the salt. I think I got a picture here on the screen. It came often from dry lake beds or by the ocean they would make these ponds and they'd dry it and then they'd scrape it. Problem was it wasn't absolutely pure. In that salt there was sand and there was calcium and there was lime and different minerals and things and they'd take the salt and they'd bang it up and they'd put it in a bag, a little burlap bag. I think I got another picture of that you'll see here. And they would dip the bag of salt in their soup or what they were cooking. And you can even read in the story of uh, Elisha in 2 Kings where talks about them putting some salt in a pot because they were afraid it was contaminated and, and uh, or he actually put salt in the spring. But uh, they used to dip these salt bags and eventually the salt uh, is leached out and when you look in the bag you got kind of this white soggy mess and it was insipid, it didn't really have any flavor left because all the salt had been leached out of it and Jesus said if the salt loses its savor, he's talking about that white substance that's got just the calcium and the minerals and stuff that was useless, it had just enough salt on it, you couldn't put it on your fields, it might hurt the plants. Matter of fact he even says it's not even good for the dunghill. Now do I need to explain to everybody what a dunghill is? <laughs> we got other terms for it. But he says you, you're going to ruin your manure. That means if you become savorless salt, you're worse than manure. <laughs> That's what Jesus is saying. This is good for nothing. You might throw it on the path because, well, you know, nothing will grow there anyway. But if that savor that we offer, if that influence that we're having, if you just have your faith for yourself and you don't share it, you become saltless salt, which has no purpose. You know, someone said once I invented dehydrated water. So that's really creative. What do you add? Water. <laughs> when you get, how do you fix savorless salt? It's good for nothing at that point. So Jesus said, have salt in yourself. The other point about salt, salt must be dispersed. If you just eat a mouthful of salt, well, you know, I, I'll admit sometimes a little bit's good. You know, you're on the airplane give you a bag of peanuts and they're so careful now the lawyers make them put on that little bag of peanuts warning may contain nuts. Did you know that? The little peanuts that they give you it, it actually says on their warning may contain nuts. But you, you eat, the, eat the peanuts and then I don't know about you but after I know I've eaten the last peanut there's not that many in the bag you can feel when there's one little peanut left in the bag and I eat it. Then I take and I I like the little salt at the bottom of the bag. Anyone else? Just get that burst. You ever try to eat one potato chip? Lay's had a very famous commercial slogan for years. You know, remember what it is? Nobody can eat just one. And it was really kind of true because I mean it would really be cruel if someone said would you like to have a chip? <laughs> I mean <laughs> it's just enough or a piece of popcorn. Yeah, so salt, it, it creates that uh, flavor, but you need to disperse it. What happens if you get too much concentration of salt? I just came back from um, Battle Creek, Michigan, and the Adventist church started a lot in Battle Creek. And there was a sanitarium there, there was a publishing house there, there were conference offers and workers there, and, and Ellen White saw everybody just turning into sort of an Adventist commune, and they were just all lumped together and she said this is no good. She said we got a message to go to the world. You guys got to get out of here. And they want to listen. They said we kind of like staying right here just surrounded in our safe society where folks are like us. And she warned several times. She said you got to spread out. Launch out. Go into the dark county. Share your faith. And eventually there was a fire. Burned down the sanitarium. Burned down the publishing house. And eventually they moved the headquarters for the office to Washington. Started to scatter and the church took off. You can have a little bit of salt in the ocean and it's full of life. You get too much salt in an ocean, you've got the Dead Sea. 
I, I've mentioned it as ad nauseum, but Karen and I were in Israel this year. One of the things we did, and Pastor Ross, and we went down to the Dead Sea. And uh, I'd been there three times before, and I'd always heard about people swimming there, and it was either Sabbath or for some reason I never did get in. This time it worked out it was a Sunday. And they said, if you want to, they'll give you a towel there, and if you bring your swim shorts with you, you can go swim in the Dead Sea. And you know, the Dead Sea is not going to be there much longer. It's losing like three feet a, a year. I mean, just it's going down really fast because they're using all the water from the Jordan River, is getting all taken off for irrigation, irrigation and it's evaporating faster than anything's coming in, and, and it's just a matter of time. Eventually, it's, you know, might take a few years, but it's going down. You can see the bank where it was a few years ago, and it's the resorts they built way up on the bank. Now the actual water is hundreds of feet away. So I thought I'd better do it while they do it's good. And, and you get out there and you float around. It's kind of fun. You stand. You're this high out of the water. There's nothing under your feet, but you're sticking out of water this much. And you can sit there in the water with your arms kind of out of the water and you're still floating. It's really weird. Never had that sensation before. Um, but there's not anything alive in there. Too much salt. Everything's dead. Great Salt Lake near Utah. I don't think there's anything alive in there. Is that right? I think it's another salt marsh, just briny water that things can't survive in. Salt has a sterilizing effect because creatures can't survive there. There's actually, um, you know where the National Archives are for the United States? It's an abandoned salt mine. There's miles and miles of salt mine underneath Kansas and in that salt mine uh, it's a perfect temperature it's hundreds of feet underground. They got miles of corridors, um, lots of empty space. There are no rats. There are no bugs because nothing can really live there. But the air is an even temperature and it's the best place to preserve documents. And so a lot of the films and the National Archives, the things that aren't digital now, they store it in an, an abandoned salt mine. So salt needs to be dispersed. You get it all together in one place. Zephaniah, I'd like to give you a scripture for each one of these points. Zephaniah 2.9 Therefore as I live, says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, surely Moab will be like Sodom and the people of Amma like Gomorrah, overrun with weeds and salt pits. You can go down to where Sodom and Gomorrah are today or where they used to be and there's nothing there. It's a desolate land that's filled with salt. You get all the salt in one place. Now Sacramento, we're pretty safe. We're getting a lot of institutions here. You know, I'm, I'm real thankful that we've got uh, Admin Health is building a new facility. There'll be a lot of Adventists working there. We've got amazing facts. You got Weimar Conference Office. I don't know if you've heard. It looks like they're going to vote, move to Sacramento. Did you know that? Northern California Conference Office. And you've got Maranatha and different ministries here. And that's nice that they work together. But there's still enough sinners to go around, right? So we don't have to worry that we've overrun things yet. We've got lots of opportunity for influence. But you don't want to just clump together. Salt can sting. Ever go out in the ocean water? Open your eyes. Oh, when we went down to the, went down to the Dead Sea, they said, you might want to get in the water. And the tour guide said, don't get it in your eyes or you will never forget it. Well, that happened to be a windy day. And there were actually waves on the Dead Sea. And one of the members in our group, he kind of went wadding off and he stepped in a hole and he lost his balance and he fell in the water and got the salt water in his eyes. He went ripping right out of the water. Just blinking, tried, had to rinse his face very quickly. It burns. Sometimes salt is used to clean wounds because it can have, seawater is not real good for that because there's usually impurities, but a saline solution is, it's got some antiseptic properties, but it stings. A person's got salt in them, sometimes what they say may sting. Jesus said to the woman in the well, go call your husband. Uh, <clears throat> that stung. <laughs> if you're a Christian and you're being salt in your community, your holiness may be sometimes a rebuke to people's unholiness. Salt is square and pure, so I'm encouraging you to be square. You ever been accused of being square? Straight laced, even fanatical. And salt is pure, pure in that it's 
it's kind of kind of like a white purity to it. There's a the salt. You know, interesting thing about salt is um, it's little square crystals. You got hexagon, different kinds of minerals form different kinds of crystals. The crystals of salt are squares. And so take it as a compliment if someone calls you square. Because Christians ought to be stable in those ways, and we ought to be pure. There, I think I've got a picture that I can show you, like a big uh, a salt mound. It's it's like snow when they mine it. Do I got that picture? Yeah. Oh yeah, there's a little squares of. Uh, go to the next picture, too. Yeah, that's a mountain of salt, just like a mountain of snow. The Bible says, "Though your sins be scarlet, they shall be white like snow." It's a symbol for purity. Do you know the New Jerusalem square too? Revelation 21:16. It's laid out as a square. Its length is as great as its breadth, and it says its length and its breadth and its height are equal. What do you call a cube? <laughs> its length and its breadth and its height are equal and it's square. So, big cube. Salt melts ice. Do we need that in the last days? Why? Jesus said, because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. Now there's two principal ways that we get salt in the world. You can get salt by the oceans. Did you know the Atlantic Ocean has more salt, higher salt content than the Pacific Ocean? Slightly higher. Um, you can get it from the ocean. You can also get salt from, you can mine rock salt. In these mines they've got these caps of mine. Some of them are hundreds of miles long. You want to hear an amazing fact? I know I'm giving you a lot of facts here. Oldest salt mine in the world is in Pakistan. They've been mining there for 2,300 years. It was discovered by the soldiers of Alexander the Great. When Alexander and his troops stopped, it's almost as far as they went on their journeys. They just entered India. They went through Pakistan. They stopped to rest their horses. They noticed all the horses were licking the rocks. And one of the soldiers wondered why. He got down, he licked the rock, and it was rock salt. They discovered that there was salt there, which soldiers really needed. And they made note of that. It later was started being mined by the locals, eventually taken over by the British. They got it back when they became independent. But it's a salt mine. They've got 24 miles, like 19 stories deep, 24 miles of tunnels. And if you go to Pakistan, you can go on a tour through those salt mines. But salt melts ice. They get that rock salt that they find in the mines. How many of you have lived in some of these colder climates? Whenever the, eye, the roads freeze, you can get the trucks out in front of you and they're spraying like seed the rock salt on the roads. It's kind of hard on the roads, but it melts the ice. Keeps people alive. So ocean water does not have the same melting point as fresh water. It's got to get a lot colder before it'll melt because the salt has an influence to melt things. You and I, the salt in our lives, we ought to know how to melt icy hearts in a world where love grows cold. A soft answer turns away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. As a Christian, have you ever been in a situation where people are starting to get hostile and you can be a peacemaker by speaking soft words? Colossians 4, 6, let your speech always be with grace seasoned with salt that you might know how you ought to answer. Salt creates thirst and prevents dehydration. Wouldn't it be mean, you know, I thought about doing a little illustration during this message. They don't cost much. I was going to get, you know, half a dozen salt shakers and give each of you on the front row one. Shake some salt in your hands, take some, pass it back. That'd make everybody thirsty during the sermon, wouldn't it? You know, I, I remember the days when I used to go to the theater. I don't now, but when I was young, we'd go and we'd get these buckets of popcorn. They discovered that the theaters sold extra salty popcorn. Now, you know why they did that? Because you'd be out there and after you ate half a bucket, you're just so dying of thirst, then you'd have to go buy their very expensive soda. And they realized that one kind of sold the other. And so salt creates thirst. I mentioned the woman at the well a moment ago, and Jesus was talking to the woman, and uh, he created a curiosity in her where she wanted to know who he was. And he finally revealed he was the Messiah and he gave her living water 
to satisfy her thirst that was created by the salt of Christ. Now you and I do the same thing as we follow Jesus. You, you want to make people curious. You want to make them thirsty. And uh, when Philip went and told um, Nathaniel, I found the Messiah, he said, who is he? He said, Jesus of Nazareth. Nazareth? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? He didn't argue with him. He just made him thirsty. He said, well, come and see. Come and taste for yourself. So sometimes what, what you do to get your friends to come and hear the gospel and to come to church is create a thirst within them. It prevents dehydration. I remember my dad used to take salt pills back in those days. He used to be afraid that he'd sweat too much, he'd have heat stroke. Covenants were made with salt. Leviticus 2.13 and for sacrifices, salt was always included. Every offering of your grain and offering you shall season with salt. You shall not allow the salt of the covenant of your God to be lacking from your grain offering. With all of your offerings you will offer salt. Now is that because God had uh, a desire for salty food? Salt cost money back then. When they put salt in their offerings, sometimes they bring salt as a separate offering, uh, it represented money. It represented a sacrifice, a gift. And it was just consumed on the altar. But God was saying, do you value me? And it was a symbol for what Jesus brought into the world with the, the saltiness of the gospel, the, um, that essential of life that we need. Mark chapter 9, verse 49 for everyone will be seasoned with fire and every sacrifice, these are the words of Jesus, every sacrifice will be seasoned with salt. Now why does that matter to you and me? Are you a sacrifice? Have you read Romans chapter 12? Brethren, I beseech you by the mercies of God that you present yourself a living sacrifice and there's to be salt in that sacrifice. Have salt in yourselves, Jesus said and have peace with one another. So if we got the salt, that salty influence of the gospel, we have peace with one another. You can read in 2 Chronicles 13, 5, Should not you know that the Lord, the God of Israel, gave dominion over Israel to David forever, to him and his sons by a covenant of salt? See, in, it's different now. When you made a covenant with someone in Bible times, there was always a feast, Every covenant was ratified by sacrifice and a meal and there was always to be a salt covenant. Jesus in his covenant that he made with David that there will not fail for you to have a son on the throne and it was a covenant of salt. Jesus being the final son of David that's to rule over everything. It's talking about an everlasting covenant. Salt is created by light and heat. Yeah, a lot of the salt in the world that they made along the shores. You know, they got roads in Italy called Via Salaria, a road that goes from Rome across to the other ocean. They, and you can still see the stones in the road that the Romans laid. They called it the salt road. They had salt roads in Arabia because the camels could not survive without it. And by the way, carnivores don't need salt licks. Carnivores get their salt from other animals. The, the agricultural societies of the world, they needed to supplement their diet with salt. The hunters, not so much. The agricultural, now you might think, Pastor Doug, that's a good argument for meat eating. The agricultural people lived longer. They let the, uh, they got the salt directly instead of trying to get it through the animal. <laughs> people say, I get my vegetables through eating the cow. He eats the greens for me in advance. But they don't live as long. But salt, typically they would create it around the Mediterranean. They would uh, create these pools. They uh, dry the, um, the salt water and distill out the salt. And it was created by the light and the heat. And as we're exposed to the light from the Lord, and we may go through fiery trials. This helps produce the salt in our characters. Jesus said, have salt in yourself. By the way, you can read there in 1 Peter 1.7, that the trial of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, that it might be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus. 
as we read the light in God's word and as we endure the trials and the testing of our faith, that saltiness is developed in our character. Salt has healing properties. As I mentioned before, uh, you can't live without having salt. There's actually a, a disease, hyponatremia. It's the extreme loss of sodium. Most of us today, we don't have that problem because salt is just in everything. If any of you ever read, you read the labels? A lot of Adventists read labels, that's good. I do. I don't, if I see milk in something, I don't eat it because it, I'm allergic. Um, so I always have to read labels. Um, I know people that say, look, I'm trying to cut down on the sugar intake. Have you ever discovered how much sugar? I got sugar in everything. Um, and salt. Try to find a label that doesn't say salt on it. And so, like I said, it's different for us today. But there are actually places in the world where they sweat. They work so hard and they sweat so much, people still die from a lack of salt. And if a person is deprived of salt, it starts with muscle cramps, nausea, vomiting, dizziness, shock, coma, and death. So how did he die, doctor? Not enough salt. When was the last time you heard that? It was a problem in Bible times. And there are places in the world where people die from that. You know, there's a doctor, Dr. Norbert Heshorn, who has been credited with saving 50 million lives. Now, how'd you like to have that on your tombstone? Now, you are responsible for saving 50 million lives. You know what happened is uh, there was an outbreak of cholera in the 1960s in Bangladesh. And they sent him, he was part of the military then, he was a physician, and they sent him with some others to try to find out a way to give orally a solution that would help rehydrate people because they were dying from dehydration. You know, one of the, it's usually the first, second, or third cause of child death in the world every year. It's diarrhea caused by various diseases, bad water, they get infections, and they lose, they become dehydrated, and they die from dehydration. And they had, this happens in India all the time, it happens in uh, Africa where we were just this year. And they're, they're in, the, in the interior and they're working hard, they're sweating profusely, it's actually an issue. Well this doctor, they found if they just, you know, gave water to people it wasn't enough. They gave water with a little sugar and they needed to replace that and they needed to replace the um, electrolytes. They needed some sodium. They first gave too much salt and they realized that it it had a terrible effect and more people died. And so they, they said, let's stop trying that. The doctor said, no, no, no. Dr. Norbert said, they need their salts replaced. This is what's missing. This is the cells aren't working. And so he went through this elaborate uh, experimentation and testing and you know what he finally came up with? He measured the amount of salt in human tears. And he thought that is the exact proportion that we need in this solution. They developed a solution that had water, some sugar, and about the same amount of salt that you would have in your tears and they began to administer it. And you know they've actually got a, a video online that a person could see where they bring in these babies they can't even lift their heads. The mothers are carrying them, they're dehydrated, and they begin to spoon feed them a little bit of the solution and the clock will show 9 a.m. And then it shows they're a little perkier by 10 a.m. And by 12 o'clock they're sitting up and then they're able to then move around by 1 o'clock and it's all from this miraculous solution. So they credit him over the years since the 60s where this happened to saving 50 million lives by developing that solution that they now distribute through India, Africa and many parts of the world. They discovered it from the amount of moisture in tears of all things. Have you ever tasted your tears? How many of you have tasted your tears? Have you ever tasted someone else's tears? I, you don't have to admit it. <laughs> if you're a mother, have you ever tasted someone else's tears? Come on, you've never kissed your kid when they were crying? 
It's salty, isn't it? You ever had to comfort someone that was weeping and you actually got some of their tears? You know, Jesus, He walked in our steps. He experienced our suffering. The Bible says He was tempted in all points as we are and yet without sin. You know, Jesus wept. Were His tears salty? He wept at the tomb of Lazarus. Shortest verse in the Bible. He wept. You know one of the short verses in the Bible? Remember Lot's wife. She look, looked back, what she turned into? A oh, clump of salt. I told you, clumping salt's not good. Jesus wept at the tomb of Lazarus. He wept over Jerusalem. He wept in the Garden of Gethsemane. He walked on our steps. He experienced our pain. He tasted our tears. And that's why He's able to heal us. Salt has a healing influence. And we are, you might say, healed by the salt of Jesus. The Lord has told us it's not optional. He said, you are the salt of the world. Do not lose your savor. In your family, He wants us to have a preserving, sanctifying influence. We present ourselves as a living sacrifice with salt. In the world, in your community, if we come together as a church and praise the Lord, you know, Karen just reminded me, Karen works as assistant clerk. She said, we just passed the 600 mark in membership. Praise God. Those of us who remember when there were 12 in the church, it's very exciting to see how God is blessing. And uh, we drove down Sierra College last night. And we saw that they've just paved the street in front of the new church and they're soon going to be restriping it. And you see the progress. We praise God. But if we clump together, we failed. If we just come together so we can salt each other, we failed. God wants us to take the message of the gospel that we live out in our lives and diffuse it in the society. One final fact about salt I thought you'd find interesting. Salt can be dissolved and then it can be reconstituted as crystals by drying it. You can mix water with salt, you can taste it, it's salty, and then you put that back out in the sun, it'll turn back into salt crystals again. It can go from crystal cube to liquid back to crystal cube. It's kind of what the Lord does with us in the resurrection. He dissolves us and then reconstitutes us. Amen? So if you want to be reconstituted in that kingdom, you've got to be salt now. I thought that uh, you'd enjoy this series of amazing facts. I hope I've been able to bring in some practical teaching. God has called us to be light and He's called us to be salt and to have those healing, preserving properties in our community. Would you like to have that in your life? Be salt. Let's sing about it. We're going to sing that long. Take my life and let it be. 3.30 and um, let's stand together as we sing.